Hi, we're here at the KC Age Care facility looking at Verticorp's uh, organic rank and cycle turbine and with Dillian Mills, the international sales manager for them. Um, Dillian, uh, this is a pretty impressive installation, 30 kilowatts. Yeah, this is one of our, this is sort of, I suppose, the smaller end of our machine scale. Our typical range is from this size, 30 kilowatts, uh, up to 110 out of a single turbine, and then after that we can put multiple turbines on to scale up to uh, whatever size we need. Um, yeah, so this is this is probably this unit stays the same. This is the same unit that that can make up to 110 kilowatts electrical. Okay. In this case, we've got a different nozzle in it. We've, we've we've reduced the power output to sort of the bottom end of our scale, um, and that's limited by the heat source we had available on this site. Um, well, what is, is what is the heat source? So we're running thermal oil here. We've okay. added sort of about a 250 kilowatt worth of thermal oil, thermal oil existing thermal oil available here. We take that thermal oil into our machine at about 140 degrees and we use that to generate power. And then on the back side of the process, rather than going through a traditional air-cooled condenser or maybe a cooling tower, we've raised our condenser temperature and we're actually putting that heat back into the building's domestic hot water and their hydronic heating hot water. So it's actually a combined heat and power solution rather than just a traditional power gen machine. So you're producing about 30 kilowatts of electrical power out of this, say 100 kilowatts. But you're also providing what, a quarter of their thermal load for hot water? Or? Yes, that's correct. So we're probably producing about yeah, the load on the, on the facility is about 100 kilowatts. We'll provide about one third of their electrical demand and probably about a quarter of their heating demand. But of course, that obviously Melbourne's very variable temperature. It's probably warm today, so there's not a huge amount of demand on it today. Uh, but during the middle of winter, you know, it's nothing for it to be, you know, two degrees overnight. I mean, this thing will be running flat out. Yeah, well, this is this place is right on the edge of the Great Dividing Range, so yes. it gets quite cold down in Mary Warren. It certainly does. They get snow down here as well. Yeah, they do occasionally. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Okay. So it's a fairly rugged unit. Um, yeah. Can you talk a little bit about the development of the system? Because I know that there's a lot that's gone into this process. Yeah. So basically, we take the core technology is a Danfoss turbo core magnetic bearing uh, refrigeration compressor. And the people behind Vertical are the people that invented that before Danfoss bought it. So the development of this machine started off in the early 90s in Melbourne, and then it was commercialized fully in Canada in the late 90s, early 2000s, and then it was Danfoss took over, did a joint venture in the mid 2000s. Uh, so yeah, so it's been a long gestation period, it's magnetic bearings, oil free operation, and particularly an LRC, that's really key because we don't have oil in our refrigerant. We don't have to manage oil, we don't lose efficiency from having oil. Uh, very high speed, spins at sort of 25 to 40,000 RPM wow. during operation. That's a very high RPM. It is a very high RPM, yeah. but there's, it's, it's, it's floating on magnetic bearings, so there's no, there's no friction. It's not like a maglev train. It's, a, it's, it's, the, it's the turbo generator can version of a maglev train, that's exactly right. Wow, okay. Now talking about efficiencies, what sort of efficiencies are you getting converting thermal energy to electrical energy roughly? Look, roughly in this one we're sort of looking at around 10 to 11 percent. Okay. Um, in, in, in a some of our other solutions we might be able to get out in the 12 and a half, 13 percent. Um, and then in some of our other, say, low temperature applications, we take a very low temperature heat in, maybe 85 degrees in, you know, you get sort of down on the other end of that scale where it might only be 6 or 7%. It very much depends on the heat you've got coming in and the, the condensing temperature that you've got going out. So then theoretically, this unit that you had, you could put in series, another one in series on this side. Absolutely. So another one of these in series, if you had more heat available, you either put a larger version of this, which is just changing the nozzle internally, uh, so this actual, this one's rated at 30 kilowatts. We can change the nozzle and upgrades this and some of the electronics, and this machine can actually make 110 as it stands. Just that we don't have the heat available on this site to do that. Okay. Now, talking about um, the, the source of heat, which is hot oil. Yep. Um, you can use hot oil. You can use jacket water, hot water. Yep. You can use hot air, exhaust air yep. from furnaces, from. Uh, and uh, diesel gensets. Yep. So there's a range of capabilities. Yeah, look, we can take, look, we can take in steam, um, pressurized hot water, uh, thermal oil, glycol. We can take a number of different heat sources in. We can take two different temperatures of heat source in, which is a unique 
unique feature of this machine. So you talked about a diesel genset application, so you had a two megawatt diesel genset. Which there's a lot of in Southeast Asia. There's a lot of in Southeast Asia, and yeah. some gas gensets as well. You can take, we can take all of the exhaust gas heat off that, so we put an exhaust gas heat recovery unit uh, on the genset. You recover all that heat out into a medium, let's say pressurized hot water. Yeah. And then we can also take somewhere, depending on the energy balance of the set, somewhere between you know, 30 and 50% of the jacket water, we can use that to do the preheat. So we can cycle the refrigerant around the, around the circuit, and we've got to lift that refrigerant from its condensing temperature, which might be 30 degrees, up to its evaporating temperature of 125. So we can use the jacket water to do half of that work, and then we use that high temperature off the exhaust to do the final bit and do the evaporation to make the high pressure gas. Okay. Ideally, the, the big issue I suppose we're talking about is efficiency. Now, this is converting thermal energy to electrical energy. Yep. And what sort of, you're, you're taking what, 250, 300 kilowatts of electric, thermal energy out of the hot oil? Yeah, so we take around, around about sort of, in this case, so let's say 250 kilowatts out, um, and we're sort of, this is normally 30 kilowatts, and we probably have an efficiency of this machine of around 10 to 11 percent uh, conversion rate. Okay. So, you know, if we take 250, we probably make sort of 25, 27 kilowatts out of the 250 that's available to us. Oh, that's excellent. Okay. So, what sort of customs you're looking at people who are doing palm oil mills, factories, steel mills, concrete mills, hotels, resorts, anybody that's got any thermal load? Basically, anywhere there's thermal load, um, we can look at getting onto the back of it. So, um, you know, we talked before about uh, diesel and gas gensets. Yep. So we can take power off diesel and gas gensets. We take the, some energy out of We take all the energy out of the exhaust, plus sort of 40, 50 percent of the jacket water, and we can use that to drive these. We can, you know, we can either make nominally, let's say, 10 percent more power off a given genset, or we might be able to reduce your fuel bill, and that's where this really comes and kicks in. Reduce your fuel bill, particularly on a diesel set, we might be able to do a seven or eight percent reduction in fuel bill. Okay. So now the important question of this video: in four sentences. Explain what an ORC is to me. It's a Rankine cycle turbine. It uses a high molecular mass, molecular mass fluid, i.e. refrigerant. We boil the refrigerant, we make high pressure gas, we turn the turbine, we condense the fluid back to a, we condense the gas back to a liquid, and we pump it back to the cycle again. So that creates the work that turns the chunk. Yep, so the, the heat going in is heating the fluid up to boil it to turn it into a gas to make high pressure gas to drive the turbine wheel, and then the other side of the cycle is condensing it back to a liquid, so we can put it back into a liquid pump to pump it back to the cycle again. Okay, I don't think we were four sentences there. I think it might have been a little bit, but you asked me, <laughs> yeah, you asked yeah. me a question. Yeah, I think it was, <laughs> you were seven before I interrupted. Okay, um, now, organic wrinkle cycle's been around for a while. Brad Whitney did the first one, this, what, 25 years ago? Yep. Um, there's been some successes and failures. Some of the people we've talked to have said, oh, you know, organic rankin cycles doesn't work. What's been the challenge? Has it been that there's been oil in the system as opposed to magnetic bearing? Look, I think part of the challenge you know, part of the challenge has been cost. Um, and other parts of the thing has been scalability. We take a lot of the, the modular design and design principles to take to build chillers on mats. We're applying that to building ORCs. A lot of the ORCs up until now have been big, bespoke designs, and they're all custom, they're all one-off. They're not a simple package in a box like this one is. Okay. So we, and we take this, the background of manufacturing compressors for chillers and manufacturing for chillers, take that design principle in, getting the cost down, getting volume up, standardizing the process so we can produce a product that is you know, relatively standard, relatively big one-off bespoke solutions that, you know, custom this, custom that, you know, custom the fortune. Uh, look, there's been some ORCs that have run for a long time. The geothermal industry does pretty good. Do you have a success with ORCs? Yeah, geothermal, yeah. yeah. Because there's, there's megawatts, gigawatts of uh, geothermal grind that comes out of the ground. It's not hot enough to drive a traditional steam turbine, uh, but it's certainly hot enough to make an, an ORC. Uh, that's one of our big, uh, our big markets is going to be just a bit of geothermal, being able to take wells that are, that are no longer producing steam at enough temperature to dry the steam turbine, but it's still got 160, 170 degree brine in the ground. We can run, all that, run on 160 degree brine day in, day out, year in, year out. Really, it's quite noisy there with that aircon compressor, isn't it? Yeah, it certainly is. We've, we've managed to 
move our way around the corner. We've got you back in some nice shades and we're not standing in the sun. Yeah, it's a beautiful day, but it's very hot. Yes. Yeah. Yep. Um, it's amazing how small that installation is. It's really the size of a large toilet. Yeah, yeah, I don't know whether I'd call it a large yeah, toilet. But, but, <laughs> we might, we might re-edit that. But yeah, okay. We might think of a better reference. It's, okay, it's the large of, size of a large closet. A large <laughs> closet. Yeah, 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 I, I like yeah. a large closet. I think we'll leave that one in actually. <laughs> <laughs> um, now, one of the, the things that obviously everybody in TDN want, or TechDevNet.com wants to know about is how can they take part in this sort of technology? Because you'd think, oh, I have to be a uh, mechanical engineer. I have to run an air conditioning business. I need to have all this capability. Uh, but when you're dealing with factories in the emerging world, especially in things like palm oil or um, cassava in you know, Vietnam or in Cambodia, the skill level is, is variable. Um, you're putting together a program to tr uh, training package to help train implementers and, and installers. Yep. You can provide the technical support, engineering support, you can provide the sales pricing and um, sales process support. Um, what sort of people would you be expecting to be working with installing this? People who have their existing mechanical engineering businesses or air conditioning businesses, would they be skilled enough to do it? Look, most of those guys would be skilled enough to do it. There's going to need to be some support if they haven't been involved in waste heat recovery before, and a lot of people haven't, It's a, it, because it's a, a pretty small marketplace. Uh, we can certainly help that side of it in terms of sourcing equipment to do waste heat recovery or helping with design. Once we've got that, you know, the process is not actually that hard. It's once we've got the waste heat into our system, um, that's pretty. After that, it's all pretty straightforward. Because so, you're talking gigawatts, or you know, hundreds of gigawatts of capacity in waste uh, heat from the geothermal, waste heat from steelworks, waste heat from processes in broke glass factories, glass furnaces, cement works, um, resorts with heating systems, resorts with heating systems, anyone that's running a diesel genset or a gas genset, anyone who's on standalone power. Look, even in some cases we've even looked at some small gas turbines, when I say small I mean 25 megawatt gas turbines, just to look at, at generating some power or making a combined cycle out of those off the existing solution so anywhere there's heat of almost any size and scale uh, we can do something with it i will say that we want reasonably high grade heat the lower t the temperature the heat the larger the system becomes and the lower the efficiency so the cost goes up so we're, we're looking for normally looking for reasonably high grade heat so what do you mean by high grade heat? high grade heat, 150 degrees 150 somewhere in the sort of the 140 to 160 site range it could go to 180 if you have 180 yep. uh, but somewhere in that type of range that's where we really want to be and then if there's low temperature coming in as well we can certainly take that to, to boost the the, the system um, but yeah, somewhere in that 140, 150 range is generally what we'd be looking for. Okay, because it sounds like, it, it probably does sound a bit confronting. I remember, I'm, like I'm a trained engineer, it took me a little while to quite get my head around what this is. But uh, with a bit of uh, background reading and a bit of support and training, uh, I think anybody who's got an understanding of air conditioning or even some people who are motor mechanics, anybody that understands compression and diesel engines can understand the thermal, the thermodynamics for this system. Yeah, look, it's, it, it, we say it's organic Rankine cycle, but it's really, it's the Rankine cycle, which is a standard steam turbine cycle. And the only difference to make it organic is that we use a fluid that boils at a lower temperature. So steam, you would typically need 250, 300 degree plus to make a steam turbine work properly. And in big power plants, it could be 450, and in some cases superheated at 650. We don't, we're not obviously not using water as our, as our fluid, we're using refrigerant and the refrigerant boils at a much lower temperature and that's where we get, that's where the organic, but the fundamentals are, it's the same as any steam turbine. So say for instance we have a factory, say a 45 tonne per hour palm oil factory that produces, you know, maybe 15 to 20 megawatts of uh, thermal reject load through its, boil, through its uh, steam gases and through exhausts. You know, depending on the temperature, you could recover maybe seven to ten percent of that, depending on what the temperature is at. Yeah, it really comes down to what the temperature is at. Um, and so yeah, obviously, in, in an ideal world, we'll have one fifty degree pressurized hot water or thermal oil coming into our system. Um, we can take lower than that temperature, um, but it, it, then it just is a matter of working out what's going to be the most cost-effective solution. It needs to be above eighty-five. Okay. Anything 85, if it's below 85, that's where we really start to have a cutoff and go, yeah, we're just not going to be able to get it to fly. Uh, and then the hotter the better. Okay, because I know some of the Chinese turbines take 
the multi-stage Chinese steam turbines take to take steam down to a very low temperature, which would be unusable for you. Yeah, we really wouldn't. You know, some of those those condensing turbines, those those condensing micro turbines. Yeah, we really wouldn't be able to get onto the back of those if they're coming. If you've got got condensate coming out of the back of one of those at 65 degrees C, you know, that's really not going to do us much good. Okay, all right. Now. Um, You've obviously been with us for with techdevnet.com for I think over a year now, yep. and uh, we're very keen to promote your technology. We believe your technology is a very excellent technology because yep. of the magnetic bearing capability. Yep. Uh, if anybody wants to find out more about the technology or would like to know about how they could get involved in the implementation and propagation of that technology, yep. they can get in contact with us and I'm sure you'd be delighted to talk to them we'd as well. Be, we'd be very delighted to talk to them and we're ha happy to help them look at the projects that they might have in the pipeline and work out where the technology might fit. Okay, so just to put it in perspective, you have a 30 kilowatt unit, you have a 100 kilowatt unit, that's the largest unit? That's the largest individual turbine, but it's a modular design. So we can go to 500 kilowatts, we can go to a megawatt, we can go to 10 megawatts if you've got that much heat. If you've got 100, you've got 100 megawatts of, of thermal energy coming out and, and you want to make 10, kilo, 10 megawatts of electricity, we can scale up to 10 megawatts if we need to be. It's probably not where the sweet spot sits for us. The sweet spot for us is probably in the 30 kilowatt to probably one megawatt range. Okay. That's probably where we're going to be best suited, but we can scale up to just about any size. Okay, and your, your focus, you're also, I notice you're interested in the geothermal space because there's a lot of waste waste, waste heat in the geothermal process because of their current technologies here. Yeah, look, most geothermal most geothermal projects have been chasing, you know, the, 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 the golden egg, I suppose. They want high temperature, clean steam. They want to run a big steam turbine. And, and it's been, that whole market's gone down a very particular, uh, that whole industry has gone down a very particular path. But there's a lot of uh, high temperature brine that would be perfect for us. A lot of these wells are capped um, that aren't even being used anymore or the, the brine is just put to waste. It's not even turned into power. Um, I've just come across a number of projects where you know there's easily you know five megawatts of 160 degree brine just waiting that's just being just being let go or pumped back under the ground with nothing being done with it. Those are the sort of projects that you know we'd love to be able to get onto those. And, well, Philippines and Indonesia, obviously the places where they yep. would be most prevalent, and of yep. course Philippines and Indonesia, those places with you know the issue with people off grid. So yeah, yeah. and the other thing is that because it's a modular solution, we can provide it in a Another big problem that happens in geothermal is you might be building out an entire geothermal system, but it could take, you know, you've got to drill wells, you've got a couple of years worth of drilling wells, and then you've got to fit out all the steam fields, and you've got to bring it back to a central turbine, and it can take years from when the first well gets drilled to when the first power is being produced, and, you know, that's hard for a geothermal developer because they've got no income. Okay. So we can offer a solution where you could do a wellhead solution that we could generate power off your first well and your second well and your third well and then that could be moved around as the wells get drilled and we can make power as the field's being um, built out and you know most people, most banks that are financing that are going to be pretty keen to see revenue coming in during that normal period which is normally just revenue going out. Yeah okay that would be very interesting because it would obviously the quicker you get money in the less uh the less money you burn and the less money you lose. Yep. Delian, thank you very much for taking time for us. I'm sorry we've had a bit of problem with flies and a bit of problem with noise, but yep. that's the beauties of uh, Australia. We missed the bushfires last week. Yes. Yeah, that was pretty brutal. Yes. Um, and, uh, you know, I look forward to seeing you in Singapore and in Southeast Asia. Yep, I look forward to being there. Thank but, you. Th